with the message today. We continue our verse by verse study in Romans chapter 12 this morning. So we're at verse 3 uh, today. Romans chapter 12, verse 3. And let's see what the Word of God says. For I say, this is member Paul, for I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. I especially call your attention to uh, the middle of that verse, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. Would you bow in prayer with me, please? Father in heaven, we ask for your anointing. We ask for the filling of the Holy Spirit as we do each and every week. And, and Lord, uh, we thank You for these that are here today. Lord, so often uh, what Paul is addressing here is something that we're very guilty of. Even those who are regular attenders in the church, it's pride. And so Lord, uh, press upon our hearts uh, the truth of Your Word today. And Lord, help us to make the necessary changes through Christ in our lives where You see fit. Lord, bless now Your Word as it goes out. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Have you ever heard the story of the two ducks and the frog? Well, there were two ducks and a frog who were the best of friends. And they uh, spent the whole summer together at a certain pond. And they played together all summer long. But as the cold drew near and the water dried up, the ducks realized that they would have to move. This would be easy for the ducks. They could just fly away. But what about the friend, the old frog? How would they, what would they do about him? Finally, it was decided that they would, the ducks would put a stick in their mouths and the frog would latch on with his mouth and they would fly him to another pond. And so they did. And it was working great. That old frog was hanging on to that stick that the ducks had. Well, just then, a farmer looked up and he saw those two ducks and that frog flying by. And the farmer said to his wife, well, that's a great idea. I wonder who thought of that. Well, proudly that old frog opened his mouth and he said, I did. <laughs> and that illustrates that pride goes before a fall. And pride is something that we all struggle with, don't we? Paul says to us right in the middle of the text not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. In other words, literally this verse is saying, I say to everyone, do not super think of yourself. Don't make yourself out to be more than you really are. You see, we have the tendency to over-evaluate ourselves. We're arrogant and we think of ourselves as better than others. And it's interesting here in verse 3 that all this previous talk of not being conformed to this world, but being transformed by the renewing of the mind, the very first aspect that Paul mentions about this renewing of the mind has to do with humility. Humility. Paul is telling us how a renewed mind should think, and he says it's about humility, being humble. Also, we talked a lot about culture over the last several weeks and how the world puts pressure on us to conform. Our culture has spent a lot of time and, and money on warning us of the dangers of low self-esteem. It's talked about in schools. Psychology focuses on it. How to increase our self-esteem. But the real danger, maybe, maybe on the other end of the spectrum, which is thinking too highly of ourselves. That is self-centeredness. And, and that's what we're dealing with now in this up-and-coming generation. So self-centered. We have inflated views of ourselves and we tend to exaggerate how important we are or how important our ideas, our opinions should be to others. We exaggerate our abilities 
by thinking we are the best at anything we do. We exaggerate, you know, we, 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 we think we're so smart, like that frog in the illustration. But he wasn't so smart after all, was he? We think that maybe we're the best dressed or best looking in the crowd. And maybe we have a supervisor tie at work. And we think that we're somebody special. Nobody can come close to touch us. Quite frankly, even as Christians, we think so highly of ourselves with our wages, the stuff that we've accumulated, our families, our education, our looks, our accomplishments, that it all goes to our heads. I'm sure you've heard that expression before. There was a great baseball pitcher named Tom Seaver. Well, he was on the verge of winning his 300th baseball game, which few pitchers had done at that time. And he was excited about this accomplishment and the game was almost over and he went over to his daughter who was there just standing in one of those box seats and he said to his daughter, only three more hours. And she kind of was like, good, I want to go home and go swim. That's what she said. She wasn't as excited about him winning 300 games as he was. Children can humble us sometimes, can't they? You know, he, he wanted her to sort of puff him up a bit about that. I'll tell you someone else who can humble us. God can. James 4, 6 tells us God is opposed to the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. I don't know about you, but I don't want God opposed to me. I don't want God against me in this life because I need His grace each and every day. And so Paul says in Romans 12, 3, don't think that you are better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves. I'll tell you one way that pride affects us. It makes us unteachable. In other words, a lot of times when someone is filled with pride, they think they're another. They're another. We have a closed mind when we're filled with pride. If I'm the CEO of the company, then my pride convinces me that I alone have what it takes to run the organization. If I'm the head coach of the team, my pride will not allow me to accept any input from others about a particular play or decision. If I'm the sheriff, the head nurse, the chief of staff, the manager, the foreman on the job, my position can go to my head such that I don't think that there's anyone else that has the skills, the ability, the charisma to do what needs to be done. Even in churches, pride is a problem. If I'm the pastor or deacon in the church, my pride won't allow me to serve anyone. Sometimes we think I'm a leader. Not a servant. Of course, Jesus was a servant. And He taught us that serving is actually leading. Those who serve are the leaders, not those who just sit around waiting to be served. So when a leader is filled with pride, he or she becomes unteachable. They don't really listen to their team or their advisors, and they become impatient or angry if those on their team or their group do not really accept their ideas. Are here. I want to share a story with you from the Bible from the Old Testament about a prideful king who was humble in battle. He overestimated his abilities. He thought a little too much of himself and his resources. And, and, and this sort of inflation of his, of his self-worth and what he was able to do brought deadly consequences. This story is found in 2 Chronicles chapter 18. You're welcome to turn there and read along if you'd like. I'll just sort of be summarizing the chapter. Again, 2 Chronicles chapter 18. Picture the scene in your mind's eye as I describe it this morning. And listen carefully. The chapter opens with two kings. King Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, he was a pretty good king. He was, he was a godly man for the most part. But then there's also King Ahab, the wicked king. You probably remember that he's the husband of Jezebel. 
I'm sure you've heard of her before. So we have King Jehoshaphat, a good king. We have King Ahab, a wicked king. And for whatever reason, Jehoshaphat formed a peace alliance with King Ahab by allowing his son to marry Ahab's daughter. Well, a few years after that, Jehoshaphat went to visit King Ahab. And King Ahab prepared a great feast for Jehoshaphat and his advisors. He fed him really well. And then he sort of enticed Jehoshaphat a bit. And, and he asked him to join forces and to go and fight at Ramoth Gilead. And in verse 3, Ahab says to Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat, will you go with me to Ramoth Gilead? And Jehoshaphat says to Ahab, yes, I'll go. We will join you in battle. But on one condition, Ahab, let us first find out the Lord's will about this battle. I will join forces with you, Ahab, and go with you to Ramoth Gilead and fight. But first, I want to hear what the Lord has to say before we go. Remember, Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, was a pretty good king. However, Ahab, king of Israel, was with him. And Jehoshaphat wanted to seek the Lord's will. You know, anytime we make a decision, job changes, something with relationships, some purchase, we need to seek the Lord's will about it. And so Ahab says, all right, in order to please you, if it'll make you happy, I'll bring my 400 prophets in and see what they have to say about this battle. And so Ahab brings his 400 false prophets, by the way. Remember when we were studying Elijah there at Mount Carmel, the prophets of Baal were all killed, you know, by Elijah at Mount Carmel. But these 400 men may have had the title of prophet, but they were not prophets of God. They are there to tell Ahab what he wants to hear. Kind of like most preachers in pulpits this morning are there to sort of tell the people what they want to hear instead of the truth. And so these 400 prophets, they say to King Ahab, yes, go ahead to Ramah Gilead. God is going to give you victory, Ahab. Go ahead and do it. Remember, we're talking about pride here. And so these prophets are feeding into Ahab's pride. They're swelling his head. And King Ahab is feeling pretty good and confident about things right now. But remember King Jehoshaphat, he said, I want to hear from a prophet of the Lord. And, and so Jehoshaphat says to Ahab, is there not a prophet of the Lord around that we can ask and see what he has to say before we go into this battle? Let's share with him. Well, King Ahab, he probably sighs at this point. He says, yes, there's a man named Micaiah who could consult the Lord for us. But I hate him. And that's what the Bible says that Ahab says about Micaiah. I hate him. Because uh, he never has anything good to tell me. Whenever he prophesies for me, it's always trouble, it's doom and gloom. All he ever says for me down on Micaiah. And Jehoshaphat says to King Ahab, well, don't talk like that. Let's hear what Micaiah has to say. And so, Micaiah is summoned to appear. Here comes God's humble servant, Micaiah. Picture it now in your mind. Remember the pride of Ahab. Remember how pride makes one unteachable and a downfall. So you have King Ahab of, of Israel. You have King Jehoshaphat of Judah. And they're all dressed in their royal robes. And the atmosphere is one filled with excitement. The prophets of Ahab, again, 400 of them are <laughs> guaranteeing victory for Ahab. In fact, Zedekiah was sort of putting on a show. And, and he made some iron... Uh, horns, and he was running around the room and he said, this is how the army of Ahab is going to gore the Syrians. And all the prophets agreed, perhaps shouting, yes, go fight. Victory for 
for King Ahab. Victory for King Ahab. But he enters the lowly prophet of the Lord, Micaiah, a true man of God. And Micaiah had already been told by a messenger, listen, these 400 prophets are guaranteeing a victory, so you might as well just go along and, and say what they say because it's going to be dangerous, you know, for you to go against or upset the king. Micaiah says, as the Lord lives, whatever my God says, that will I speak. So Micaiah boldly stands before King Ahab and he pronounces God's judgment upon him in verse 16. Micaiah says, in a vision, I saw all Israel scattered on the mountains like sheep without a shepherd. And the Lord said, their master has been killed. Send them home in peace. And Ahab is furious. Micaiah, how dare Micaiah go against him in front of all people for everyone to hear. And, and, and uh, Ahab says to Jehoshaphat, didn't I tell you Jehoshaphat, I hate this man and this man hates me. He's predicting gloom. He says all the soldiers are going to be scattered on the hill and I'm going to die. I hate it. And the false prophet Zedekiah comes up and he slaps God's prophet Micaiah across the face. Ahab ordered that Micaiah be arrested. And Ahab says, Feed him nothing but bread and water until I safely return from battle. And Micaiah, the prophet of the Lord, spoke in bold fashion, saying, If you return from battle, King Ahab, then you mark it down.
Paul said not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. Don't think that you're better than you really are. When we do that, we set ourselves up to fall. When we do that, we set ourselves up to fail. We saw in King Ahab's situation, God knows how to humble us. I don't know what you've been into. I don't know what you've been a part of. But if you've been away from God and you're His child, He knows how to humble you. He knows what things to move around in your life to get your attention. And perhaps He's doing some things in your life today. Pay attention to what He's doing. God gives grace to the home. He gives grace to the home. Would you bow in prayer with me, please? Father in heaven, we thank you for these few moments to share your word. Lord, so often we're like that old frog. We want to receive the glory for some grand idea. We want the recognition for whatever it is. Lord, too often we're like King Ahab. We become so set in our ways. We think that we know it all. We become unteachable until we meet our demise. Lord, help us to remember that yes, we came from dirt. He created Adam from the dust of the ground, as the Bible says. But Lord, through Christ Jesus, we are also your child. That makes us so much special to you. But Lord, we can't be special to you and special to this earth and the people of this world at the same time. As Jesus said, you cannot serve two masters. And Lord, help us right now to search our hearts. And I feel the pride. Is it all about having the biggest house on the street or the nicest truck or car in the parking lot or, or, or making having the biggest thing? What is it that I live for each and every day? Is it to try to feed my pride? Or is it to live for Christ? Lord, help us to make an honest evaluation of ourselves this morning. And Lord, where do you show us that there are some issues, where there are some changes that need to be made? Give us the strength, the ability through Christ to make those changes. Bless this time of invitation, oh Lord. I don't know if anyone needs to come forward for any decisions, but if they do, I'll be standing down from them. Lord, bless, oh Holy Spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.